Well, God has been good to us already, amen? Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to the book of John. John chapter 16. And we are going to begin with verse number seven. John chapter 16 and verse number seven. When you have it, say amen. The Bible says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and see you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I've got many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all the truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Praise the Lord for his word this morning. Today, I just want to speak to you briefly from the subject, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. The convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father God, we are so grateful for all that has transpired thus far. But now, Lord, it is time for us to hear from your word. And because of this, Lord, we realize that we are inadequate to disseminate the truths herein that lie. So, Lord, we're asking for your Holy Spirit to come now and speak for yourself. Let your grace fill this room and may people come to know who you are in a new way. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. On last week, we discussed and we declared that there are two baptisms. How many baptisms, everybody? Two baptisms. There is the baptism by water. The baptism by water is a uh, remembrance or a reflection of the fact that God washes away our sins. He throws our sins in the sea of forgetfulness. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He covers our ugliness. He lets go all that has transpired in our lives. This is what happens at water baptism. We are released from our past. We are set free from the bondage that we were in. We are let go from the things that so easily beset us. But we also found out that there's another baptism, and that is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is representative of the fact that God himself comes into our lives and he empowers us to live for God. Can you say amen? Amen. How many know we need power to live for God? We cannot do it in and of ourselves. But the question is, if in fact this is true, that the Holy Spirit comes, and it is, that he comes into our lives, how does he actually do this? How does he transform us? How does he give us strength and power to work and walk with him, talk with him, and operate within the Christian life? I'm going to show you three ways that the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and transforms us from the inside out. From our text, we find out 
that Jesus knows that soon he is about to die. He's about to give his life as a ransom for many. He knows that his time is short, and so he's talking with his disciples. And in John chapter uh, 14 through 16, we see that Jesus is now revealing to the disciples that even though he is leaving, he is leaving them not alone. He's not going to leave them fatherless, one text says in John chapter 14. But I'm going to send you an advocate from the Father. His name is the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send you a comforter. And the word comforter there in the Bible, in the original language, means someone who comes alongside you. Someone who walks with you. It's the Greek word parakletos. Someone who comes next to you and provides for you what is necessary in order for you to get done whatever needs to be done. This is who the Holy Spirit is. And so what we see as we read through chapters 14 through 16 in the book of John, we see that Jesus' ministry is actually going to continue on, but it won't be continuing by Jesus himself. The continuing of Jesus' ministry is going to be pushed forward by the Holy Spirit. And because the Holy Spirit is now going to take over the ministry that Jesus was doing, the ministry that Jesus had implanted is now going to be spread across to the entire world because it will not be limited by human agency or by the focus of uh, Jesus being one singular person because the Holy Spirit is God himself. I said the Holy Spirit is God himself, which means he is omnipresent. That means he can be everywhere at once. Come on, say amen. amen. Did you know that Jesus no longer can be everywhere at once? That's what he gave up to have you become a child of the king. He gave up his omnipresence. The only way he can be present with you is through the Holy Spirit. Somebody say hallelujah. So the Holy Spirit can be everywhere at the same time. He can talk to you and he can talk to me even while I'm praying. The Holy Spirit is also omnipotent. That means omnipotent. He has all power in his hands. The Holy Spirit can do literally anything. This is the power of God. The Holy Spirit has all the power of the Godhead in him. He can do whatever is necessary to accomplish the goal that the Godhead wants to do. He's omniscient. He's what everybody He's omniscient. This means that he knows everything. He knows everything. And he knows everybody. And this leads me to the first thing that the Holy Spirit does when he comes into your life. The Holy Spirit, when he comes into your life, does one thing. He convicts you of your sin. He convicts you of your sin. You see, the Holy Spirit knows us better than anybody else. As a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit knows you better than you know yourself. The Holy Spirit knows everything that has transpired in your life. He knows everything. He knows how your mama treated you. He knows how your father treated you. He knows how your cousins and your uncles treated you. He knows how your teachers treated you when you were coming up in school. He knows what you've been through. He knows what you have experienced in your life. He knows the wrong ways that you've taken and the right ways that you've taken. He knows all your history. He's got it all in his mind because he knows everything about you, but he still loves you. He still loves you. God knows everything about you, and he still loves you. Hallelujah. Some of us spend thousands of dollars trying to keep people from finding out everything about us. But God knows everything. 
we're exposed before him. He knows the inner workings of our hearts. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that God knows not only our actions, but he knows the thoughts behind our actions. He knows not only that we did something, that we wanted to do it, but he knows why we did it. God even knows when we wanted to do something, but we couldn't do it because the opportunity was taken away from us, and God still records and knows why you wanted to do it. But he still loves you. He still loves you. He still cares. You see, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, he proves to you who he is by revealing to you who you are. You remember the woman at the well? You remember that story? You remember she came and the disciples had left to go into the city to get some stuff and Jesus was there alone and you know you're not supposed to be alone with a woman at the well. Hello, somebody. <laughs> Especially a prophet. But Jesus had to meet her at the well. He had to meet her there. She came there on her own because she wouldn't go there with the rest of the women of the community because she wasn't living righteous. So she came there by herself. Are y'all with me today? She couldn't come along with the crowd because the crowd didn't like her. Somebody in here knows what I'm talking about. She didn't fit in the club, the group, or the crowd. And so she came to the well, and she met Jesus there. And Jesus said, would you give me some water? And she said, you don't need to be asking me that. Jesus said, if you knew who was asking you, you would give you would ask of me to give you living water that springs up into new life. And they began to have this incredible conversation. And through this conversation, Jesus began to expose that he was God. Jesus began to reveal that he knew everything about her. Are y'all with me today? He began to talk with her and show her, and she said, well, listen, <laughs> I got to get out of here. He said, yeah, I know you got to go because you got some issues. Because you've got five husbands, and the one you're with now ain't even yours. Lord, have mercy. The Bible says that when the disciples came back, she left her pots sitting at the well spilling over with water. She left her pots. The whole reason why she came there, she left her pots. She went back to the city and she, watch, watch this. She began to witness and tell everybody, come see a man who told me everything that I've ever done. He must be God himself. When the Holy Spirit came into my life, I realized who he was because he revealed myself to me. He put a mirror in front of my face and showed me who I really was. He showed me the inner workings of my mind and my heart, and he showed me that I was selfish, that I was self-aggrandizing, that I was more concerned for myself than anyone else. And he said, your problem is you have not forgiven people in your life, namely your father. My father had since been dead quite a few years, but I still had not forgiven him. And this was holding me back from having any connection with people. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me today. If you are holding something against somebody, please let it go in Jesus' name. And so the Holy Spirit, when he comes in, he reveals to you who you are, but also he reveals who God is. And the Bible says he convicts the world of the sin of not believing that God is God. You see, the problem with the world is that they cannot believe in a God who cares enough about them to send his son to die for them. That's the problem. The problem is we don't believe that God really loves us, but he does. I said, but he does. I said, but he does. He loves us. He gave his only begotten son that you and I could believe on him that we should not perish but have everlasting life. God is not trying to judge you and send you to hell. God wants to bring you into the family fold 
He loves you. And this is what the Holy Spirit convicts you of. He convicts you of the fact that he's God, but he came and became man for you. He put on a flesh astronaut suit and came into this filthy world, became like you and me, never to return. When we see Jesus, we're going to see him in the flesh. Are y'all with me today? It was a one-way ticket, John. It was a one-way ticket, man. He couldn't go back to being the God that he was, but he's now confined now to a human body forever for you. That's how much he loves you. I thought I'd get a shout of glory on that. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He convicts you that God truly and deeply loves you. Secondly, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit comes in and not only convicts you of sin, but he does something else. He convicts you of what true righteousness is all about. In other words, he convicts you on what the true escape is from your sin. The problem for most of us is that we use every other avenue to cleanse ourselves except Jesus. We use every other avenue to set ourselves free from our sinfulness and our, righteous, and our uh, unrighteousness by trying to cover it up, by trying to find new ways. Many seek out after drugs and are addicted to drugs or alcohol. Many are involved in ultra-sexual relationships, trying to escape what's in their mind and in their heart. They know they're guilty. They feel the guilt and the shame in their lives, and they're trying to escape. But that is not going to cleanse you, saints of God. But Jesus will. Jesus is our righteousness. Can you say amen? Amen. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But if we confess our sins, he is what everybody? He is what everybody? Faithful and just to do what everybody? Forgive us of our sins and to do what? Cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. Somebody say hallelujah. If we confess our sins, what does it mean to confess? The word confess literally means to agree. In other words, when you confess what you're doing is you're agreeing with God, his assessment of you is correct. I am wrong and he is right. That's what confession is. Confession is saying, God, you're right, I'm wrong, I accept your judgment of me. Thank you for Jesus who sets me free. This is what confession is. It's not about delineating every little sin because there's only really one sin, and that is the sin of unbelief. Every other sin flows out of that one sin. It's not believing God. It's not trusting God. That's the reason why we do the wicked things we do, because we don't trust God. We know God is real, but we don't trust him. We know God is able, or we think that he's able, but we don't trust him to do the thing that we want him to do. I gave an example. I'll give it here. Some of us trust God for everything except for our future husband or wife. We trust God for our finances. We trust God for our homes. We trust God for everything. But in terms of finding the right husband or wife, we won't won't trust God there. Because I want what I want. Hello, somebody. And I got to get God to rubber stamp what I want. Are y'all listening to me today? I know it's a lot of people involved in this kind of thing. You've got to give that over to Christ too. Come on, say amen. Amen. God is not going to give you somebody ugly. Come on, say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God is going to give you somebody that you're attracted to and who's attracted to you. Yes, he will. I'm a witness. Why do I bring this up? You see, when I met my wife, I'm going to tell this little story. When I met my wife, pastor, I was dating somebody. <laughs> and the person I was dating 
was, was, the, was my choice. You, 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 see, you, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. She was my choice. And I began to try to convince myself that this was God's choice too. Have you ever done that? Okay, y'all ain't being real. I'm like, okay, okay. So her name was Michelle. And I was like, yeah, I got a sister named Michelle. She must be God's choice. Her brother's name was Marcus. I got a brother named Marcus. She must be God's choice. Are y'all with me today? I mean, the silly things we do to try to justify our terrible decision making. And so we were having issues. Me and this individual were having issues. And we just couldn't get on the same page for whatever reason. So God introduced Rhea into my life. Somebody say hallelujah. Mm, mm. And he introduced her by having me, John, give her Bible studies. <laughs> he was going to start us off on the right foot. Come on, say amen. You see, my wife grew up a Baptist. She didn't know anything about Seventh-day Adventists, but she met somebody who was on fire for the Lord. Come on, say amen. She met somebody who had the Holy Spirit with them. And so, saints of God, we began to study. We read. We read all kind of, but we read Ellen White. We read the Bible. We was reading everything, anything. And, and the thing about this, the thing about it is, and, and hear this, ladies, everything I gave her to read, she ate it up. That's how I knew she was the right one, John. I was like, man, she, you finished reading that? Man, well, let's, let's read this. And so we began to study together and so on and so forth. And so this, situ there, this uh, event was happening <clears throat> where I had to invite my, <laughs> my future wife <laughs> as I was going down to be with the woman I was presently involved with. <laughs> So, you know, now, now, mind you, Rhea and I had not done anything. We hadn't, you know, we hadn't exchanged anything. We just studying the Word of God together. Okay, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so anyway, we go to this event, we have this event, and this individual and I get involved in a, an argument, a, di a difference of opinion. Euphemism. And so she, she asked me to drive her home <clears throat> from this hay ride thing that we were doing, this fire, bomb fire thing we were doing. But so anyway, so I'm driving her home, and as she's yelling at me, as she's yelling at me, God, listen, listen, I promise you this happened. I'm not kidding. God came to me, and he had a bell ring in my head. He said, ding, she's not the one. He said it just like that to me. He said, she, she's yelling, she's screaming at me, and, I'm, and it's making her even more mad. <laughs> and God said, ding, she's not the one. She's not the one. I said, Okay. So I took her home, drove back, and got connected to my future wife. Come on, say amen. The same day. Same day. God made a, I mean, that, that's how it happened, saints. And after, and listen, after that, it was smooth sailing. Because the Holy Spirit knew who I was supposed to be with. See, the Holy Spirit knew that I was going to be a preacher. And some, some ladies aren't ready to be a preacher's wife. Oh. All right, all right, all right. I'm going to leave that alone. Okay. Are y'all with me today? Yeah. Especially Adventist preacher's wife. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> but see, my wife, even though she grew up Baptist, God was in her. God was living in her. And God connected us in a supernatural way. I had to learn to listen to God. Because his righteousness is the only righteousness that matters. His decision-making is the only decision-making that matters. 
my choice don't make no difference. As a matter of fact, my choice has got me messed up all the time. But it's his righteousness, his decision making, his choices that bless us. Saints of God, hear me today. Nobody can do you like Jesus. Nobody can free you like Jesus. Nobody. Nobody. And nobody will cover you like Christ. He'll set you free if you let him. If you let him. Lastly and finally, the Bible says that when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, he continues the work of Jesus by convicting us of judgment. By convicting us of judgment. Hear me. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life, here's what happens. He makes you a child of God and you immediately become a witness for him. When you become a witness for him, you become a target of the devil and the enemy. And now people start making judgments about your life. Are you all with me today? Because people are trying to prove whether or not you've got the real God in you. I find it interesting that explosion over the last 10 to 15 years of these, what do they call them, uh, these television shows, uh, reality shows. Reality shows, right? And in some of these reality shows, they have people living together. Have, have any of you seen these shows? Okay, y'all going to act like you don't know. Okay, all right, all right. Do y'all know what I'm talking about, these reality shows? Okay, and they show these people living together, and they show almost every second of every day that they have, they spend with each other, and you find out they start arguing, they're fussing. Why are they showing this? Why is this even interesting? You know why? Because people truly want to know who actually lives according to what they say they are. They even had a show called The Preachers of L.A., People began to watch this show. Why? Because they wanted to see if preachers really were real preachers or were they fake. You see, that's what the world does with us. When the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, people are making a judgment concerning us. Are we truly filled with the Holy Spirit? Do we really know God or are we being fake like a whole lot of other people on this planet? The Bible says when Jesus showed up, Jesus said, I bring with me judgment in the book of John, chapter 9. He said, when I come, I bring judgment. In other words, when I come, you have to make a decision about me, whether or not I'm actually from God or not. You've got to make a decision. You've got to make a choice. That's what the word judgment means. It means to make a choice, to make a decision. You have to make a choice. Is God real or is he not real? Can God truly save or does he not save? Does God truly love me or does he not love me? Who is God? You've got to make a choice because, ladies and gentlemen, hear me. We are coming to the close of earth's final history. That choice is going to make the difference between whether you go to hell or whether you go to glory. You've got to make a choice. Do you believe God or do you believe Satan and his lies? Satan says that God is wrong. That God does not love you and that all he wants to do is force you to serve him. But God, through Jesus, teaches us that he hasn't forced anybody. He's loved us into his fold. The Bible says, with loving kindness, I've drawn you. Hear me today. God doesn't force anybody into his kingdom. He loves you in the kingdom. You know who scares you into their kingdom? 
He scares you and makes you think you can't make it. If I don't do this, if I don't do that, and all that kind of, God doesn't do that. God says, I've already covered you. I've got you covered. Just believe on me and watch me work my power in your life. But hear me, when you become a witness for God, you must be prepared. You must be prepared to do what God has called you to do and to trust God through the accusations. The Bible says that Satan is an accuser of the brethren. He's a what, everybody? He's constantly accusing God's people of not being true, not being real. But Jesus has you covered. I said, Jesus has you covered. And if you believe on Jesus Christ and you never give up your belief on him, you continue to seek to walk with him. You continue to seek to talk with him. You continue to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. God will never let you fall. And you will be vindicated along with God at the end of time. Michael's going to stand. And standing with Michael is going to be God's people. Standing firm on the witness that God is true. Everything he said is true. His love is real. And his mercy is everlasting. This is who the Holy Spirit is. He seals you, the Bible says, for the day of redemption. He protects you. He holds you firm. He walks with you. He leads you into his path of righteousness for his name's sake. He blesses you with the power to walk forward with God. Without the Holy Spirit, you will never make it. But with the Holy Spirit, we are victorious. The Bible says that nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Neither death nor life, nor things past, nor things to come. Nothing can separate us from his love. The Holy Spirit makes that real in your life. And so if it is your desire to have the Holy Spirit in your life, just stand with me as we close. Just stand with me as we close. Ask God, God, please make, please make your truth real in my life. Father God, you see your people standing. We have a deep desire to fully live in us and to walk out Christ's life through us because we know we can't do it ourselves. As we stand, we acknowledge our inability to do We know and we acknowledge that to bless us, to invigorate us, to empower us, to fill us with your life. So, God, we ask that you do that today in Jesus' name. Make us your children today in Jesus' name. And give us a deep knowledge and understanding to know that your love never fails, that you love us and you care for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God be with you. Let's continue to stand for our closing song, Everlasting God. Stand with us and sing. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever, our Lord, our strong
ever leave or forsake us, but continue to follow us all the days of our life until such time as we come into your presence in peace. Lord, as we leave this place, give us the love of Christ in our hearts that others might see Jesus in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.